Good morning from our remote locations. Under the uh, current conditions, I wanted to let you know that I'm here. And I guess we're going to be uh, at a distance for a while, but uh, I am available for you. Uh, you can call my office phone. You can call. Um, uh, you can email me. Uh, I'm generally up when our class is up. I'm going to be online and ready all the time. Uh, just like as we were in class. Um, so if you email me and e-learn during class or during my office hours as scheduled, I'll be available for you to help you uh, get through what we're, we're currently um, uh, undergoing. So we left off in class talking about the Greeks, and I wanted to come back to that and talk just briefly about Alexander the Great. There's going to be another little video that you're going to watch that's going to go with this last uh, portion of the unit on the Greeks, and, um, and then we'll get into the Romans. <clears throat> but I, I, I do want to talk to you for about 20, 30 minutes maybe about Alexander the Great. Uh, I think he's important. I, I, I do want to talk about a few things that occur after that too, but it's important for me to be able to explain to you some of the overall trends that are going on around the world besides what you are reading in the textbook as you are reading the textbook. Um, so anyway, I'm glad to have you all back and uh, I'm here and I'm going to talk today about Alexander the Great. And so, um, the first thing that you need to know about him is that um, he started out at a very young age. He lived from about 356 till about 323. He had a very short life, um, uh, maybe 233. We don't know uh, exactly. We do know that he came to the throne around the age of 20 or 21. He was very young. Uh, but at a very young age, people had noticed that, that, that there was something special about him. And so <clears throat> it was once said that it, when they saw him uh, uh, trying to tame a horse that, that it looked like uh, two uh, lions tr fighting to see who would be king of the jungle <laughs> or something to that effect. And, uh, it, but anyway, he apparently trained this very untrainable horse called Bocephalus, um, which became his steed throughout many of his campaigns. Uh, but this horse was supposedly untamable, uh, and he tamed it and, and, and won much acclaim uh, through that. Um, a very interesting, he was a non-typical youth. He had a passion for learning, although uh, because of his uh, kingdom responsibilities, um, he did not have time for his mind to mature. Um, he could have gone on and been a highly educated individual, uh, but he was smart enough to bring people around him who were brilliant. Um, he took a, uh, a contingent of, of scientists um, with him uh, on his expeditions. He was trained by Aristotle um, in his youth uh, before Aristotle returned to, to Athens to open up his school. Um, and, and I don't know if we finished talking about him, but uh, a very interesting uh, background. But, but he did provide um, Alexander the Great with a great background knowledge of what to do to be a good leader. Uh, given that time period and the constraints that he lived under, um, he was a fairly good administrator. He was um, uh, f fair to the vanquished, uh, but those who stood up to him were, were often penalized. Um, he went on a tremendous campaign after consolidating um, Greece. He launched a campaign into the east, which took him uh, about 10 years. And by the end of his campaign, he was dead, we think from what is today, malaria. Um, much of his engagements were uh, against the Persians. His first major engagement was against Darius III. Darius III, 
uh, had basically conspired against him and tried to get him overthrown. And, and anyway, he crossed the Hellspawn in about 334, we think, uh, with an army of about 30 to 40,000 men. This is a small army, but it's a highly mobile army. It's not an army that's going to bog you down like a million men or even a half a million men or even a half, 100,000. Uh, this is a fairly mobile force that can vanquish armies, and it did. Um, his first major engagement after securing his, his homeland and crossing the Hellspont was, was a, against Darius at Granicus River. Um, there he defeated the king's forces. Uh, there Clytus the Black saved his life. From there he goes on to Isis. Um, and, and in Isis, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Persians resolve to stop him at all costs. They engage in a... In a, in a, in a, they, they recommend a scorched earth policy to stop him advancing with his army because he doesn't have supply trains and he's living off the land and they know that. And so by denying him uh, this, 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 this ability to, to maneuver on the land uh, was, was a good idea, but it, they didn't listen to the Greek mercenaries that were in their employment. And so they continued on with the campaign to try to stop Alexander. But really, the scorcher burning everything in his path would have probably been the best thing to stop him. Uh, at the Battle of Gordius, uh, at, 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 at Gordium, uh, he, he engaged King Gordius. King Gordius had presented him with this fabled knot, and he said if he could you know, untie this knot, somehow that uh, and he would be the master of Asia. He pulled out his sword and cut it. He went from there uh, to the Gaza into what is today Egypt and, and the Sinai in that area and engaged the Persians uh, under who were in control of that area. Um, <clears throat> he basically does some very important things when he's there. When he was in Mesopotamia, he went into... Uh, uh, the, the, the Ziggurat and proclaimed he was Marduk. When he is in Egypt, he proclaims that he is Amon, uh, come alive. And so he is to be worshipped as a god. And uh, the people are kind of, you know, his troops are fine with it until he gets deep into Asia. At the, at the Gaza, he really does commit a few atrocities. He takes the commander who finally, he, after a long siege, and in fact, the siege was fantastic. He builds this, he builds this 250-foot uh, high hill from which to launch his catapult and ballista into the city uh, while it's under siege. And when, when it's finally over, he takes the commander and he has his, uh, he has his, 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 uh, his, his heels bored out uh, uh, drilled out and then and then cauterized uh, while he's alive, and then has him dragged around the city uh, like Troy, I, I, you know. Uh, and uh, but anyway, it's it's it, it goes into the Greek mythology and all of this. Uh, from there, and and basically he enslaves the entire population because they withstood his his demands. His next major engagement is at Guagamela. At Guagamela, uh, it is a absolute rout. He has about 500 killed in action, maybe 5,000 wounded, but there's probably 50,000 uh, Persians who have either died or who are incapacitated as a result of the engagement. Uh, and this he does in October of 331. So he's already been on the campaign trail about two years. As he is moving towards the winter capital in what was Bactria, and you know, Alexander's this fantastic guy who just renames everything after himself. Uh, he renames all these provinces. They're, they're like Alexandria something, Alexandria or Alexander this. Uh, but anyway, in Bactria, he finally catches up with Darius. And what happens is Darius is fleeing from him after Guagamela. He's captured the baggage trains, his family, and uh, all the loot, everything. He's, he's made off. He, this, he's, this is, he's won. He's basically defeated the enemy. 
Uh, but he wants to confront his mortal enemy, Darius the Third. Darius the Third retreats hastily and takes off, and and and, Dar and, Dar and Darius runs, and and basically Alexander takes off with a couple, maybe a hundred, maybe two hundred, maybe three hundred men to try to track him down and, and catch him. But anyway, he takes off towards Bactria. And when he gets there, the local satrap, uh, the governor, is a guy by the name of Bessus. And Bessus is the governor general. Basically, he's working for Darius. And he is treasonous. And basically, he, 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 kills, uh, he kills him. Uh, and uh, but but he tries to kill him anyway. He and then he takes off. In the process, Alexander finally catches up with Darius because he's wounded. He's mortally wounded, and and he raises water to his lips and he asks him, you know, is there anything I can do for you and your family, etc. Because he knows he's about to blend the Roman or the the, the the Greco Empire with with the with the Persian Empire. This is his whole plan. And and when it's done, uh, he he's extended his empire all the way into India, uh, creating the Seleucid Empire there in the future. Which you know the Indians will tell you, yes, we have a Greek heritage, <laughs> but it, it's and but they would say their Hindu heritage is way more important. But I, I think the Greeks really opened up their minds. <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> By the way, if you hear me coughing and sneezing, <clears throat> I have the worst allergies in the world. Just wanted to let you know. From there, <clears throat> he goes on to Babylon, where he basically enthrones himself in Mesopotamia. He becomes a god. He goes into Marduk, this whole Marduk phase. Anyway, from there, he goes further east. <clears throat> he marches east. And he engages the Maldians, uh, basically along the Indus River, we're fairly certain. <coughs> His ultimate plan is to go to China, conquer China. I don't know how he's going to do that, but anyway. He gets to the Maldians, and, and, and he's, he's trying to coerce his men into going north to China, and they won't, but they're going to go ahead and, and assault this city. And he's mad as hell at the troops because, you know, they, they've already bucked him once about going to China. And, and they weren't real warm to the idea. Um, and so to make his men atone themselves, he, he is the first over the walls into this, this fortified city, this enemy city. And he, and he forces the army to come in and save him. And there's only a couple guys that are around to fight with him. And ultimately, they lay down their lives. He, is, he, he gets wounded seriously before the men crash through the gates and come over the walls trying to save him. But he is wounded, and he's, you know, some historians speculate that it may have been as long as six months, you know, some historians say maybe three months, two months. Uh, but he did lay up for a while after that. He was wound, wounded. And his men came by his tent while he was wounded and kissed his garments and, you know, wanted to, 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 to pay their respects and, you know, establish their, 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 their the, the, reestablish their, their loyalty to him after not really wanting to go to China or what was called Kappa at the time. Um, so he really is an interesting guy. He knows how to be an actor at times, uh, but the men come by to kiss his garments. They, 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 they want to show their respect for him and, and everything. Anyway, when the camp, when this is over and he heals up, he marches to the Indian Ocean basically and, and, he doesn't have enough ships to get all of his men home, so he sends about half of them home, and then the other half have to march across Baluchistan, basically, basically through Iran and then back to Mesopotamia. And they're not real happy about this. And, and about half the men die crossing the desert of Baluchistan. Uh, at one point, one of his scouts brings him some water they found at a small oasis, and, and rather than drink this water in front of his men, he simply poured it out on the ground. He said, come on, there's not enough to share. And, and anyway, when he gets there, he's half mad, and his troops are, you know, they're, they're, they're angry, they're grumbling, they're upset. Uh, and they begin these drinking matches, what the Greeks would call a symposium. And every night they would get heavier and heavier. And I think at the beginning of this, at this unit, I told you these guys are drinking fortified wine. This is what Willie the Wino drinks, 15%. This isn't easy stuff to drink. Anyway, 
they drink by the courts, you know, leaders, what have you. Um, anyway, they get into these drinking contests, and uh, um, he is basically acting like a king in one drunken at one symposium. Clytus the Black, who had saved his life in one of the first major engagements, said, "You know, you you know, you didn't win these wars. Your your the troops did, and your father's victories were much greater." And and one of the guys tried to hustle him out of the room before he could really upset Alexander the Great. And, and finally, the guy turned before he could get him out of the room, started to say something else. Alexander Phillips, his javelin hurled it at him and killed him uh, instantly. And and so um, he has now been dishonored by somebody in public. And he goes into this kind of drinking, this, this routine, uh, for a few days, and, and he catches malaria one night. Um, we think it was malaria, some type of fever. And um, anyway, before the fever could break, and oh, oh, oh let me back up. His, 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 uh, he was, bi many of the Greeks were bisexual, and, and Alexander was bisexual. His homosexual lover, Hesphestion, had died, and, and this really just set him off on it. In a deep, dark, abysmal spiral downward, if you could, you know, imagine emotionally and, and psychologically what happened to him. And um, anyway, he had a bunch of gold burned, and, and you know, I don't know what it, 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 he set up a temple and, and ignited it, and did all these things. And he, in one, he slaughtered a tribe that he had captured and enslaved to to Hesphestion's ghost. From this, it just gets worse and worse. It's about 230, 3.23 BC, something like this. And so Alexander is beginning to drink more and more, and he goes into these symposiums, and one night he catches malaria. And very shortly thereafter, he drinks again. And he drinks like five, six quarts of this Macedonian wine, about 15%. That, that's pretty heavy-duty stuff. And, 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 and then he dies, and, and on his deathbed, you know, they asked him, you know, basically, you know, who are you going to leave the, the, the empire to? And he said, it's already done. You guys are in charge. And so they divvied up the empire, what becomes known as the Hellenistic Empire. It is divided between uh, Ptolemy Legus, Ptolemy Legus, who gets basically all of Egypt and most of the Mediterranean areas, and so what you end up with are these Greek pharaoh, these Greek pharaohs, the, the Ptolemaic pharaohs. And, and this famous, uh, this tomb hunter down in, in Egypt today, I forgot his name again, he's, he's a character. <laughs> You've watched some videos of him. He, um, he uh, has found the Greek tombs also. And, 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 it, and he's found the rows that they're laid out in. Uh, just like the Romans, and and so it's a fascinating time in in Egyptian history too, uh, besides Greek history, uh, as as we are talking now. Uh, but anyway, so Ptolemy Legus is basically becomes the master of Egypt, and and the Ptolemaic uh, Greeks last until the uh, the age of Cleopatra. So, from the Greek input until Cleopatra, you basically got Greco pharaohs. Greek pharaohs, and in most of the imagery that you see of these pharaohs during that time, they do not really have African features, or shall I say even North African features. Okay, so Antigonus gets control of Macedonia, most of Greece, uh, and he gets control of the Aegean areas, and Seleucus, Seleucus is given the Eastern Empire. Uh, basically, all of Persia, all the way to 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 India. This one is is a, a, a that one lasts until the rise of the Parthians, and the Parthians become a real thorn in the side for the Romans. In fact, early on in the Roman Empire, much of the fighting after they conquer the Greeks is done further east against the Parthians and. Many of these Roman legion commanders die fighting um, in the East. What I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is the rise of mystery religions and some of the philosophies that emerge as a result of, of, of what has transpired in, in Greece and, and some of the heritage that comes out of Greece. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what is the rise of the mystery religions. Uh, 
what you begin to see in in Egypt is the rise of of the Orphic Brotherhood, which believes in salvation, the drinking of the blood of a bull, and then you eat the bull. Uh, the Cybel cult had baptism with bull blood. Uh, the cult of Isis uh, had fasting, praying, and submission in holy water for everlasting life. Um, and so, again, you see this element of syncretism coming back into play where some of the early Christian ideas are also formed around some of the early Greek ideas and even later some of the Roman ideas. Um, <clears throat> so one of the phil philosophies that I wanted to mention to you just briefly, uh, a couple of them. Uh, one are the Cynics. Uh, the Cynics is, is a school of thought founded by uh, Anithenes in 440 BCE. They followed the doctrine of simplicity in life uh, in order so that you do not possess in order not to be possessed. And so this goes really against materialism. Um, then you have Zeno of Asitium. Zeno of Asitium was the founder of Stoicism and the Stoics. The Stoics believed that you should pretty much do your duty in life. You know, don't get overly involved with politics or anything like that. Just, just kind of lead your life and be somewhat apolitical. Be patient. Uh, work hard. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, then you have Epicurus, who comes up with what is called the Epicurean Dream. Uh, Epicurus lived from about 341 until about 270 BCE. So he lived a rather l uh, long life. But this is where the idea of the Epicurean dream comes from. And in the Epicurean dream, everything we should do is in moderation. We should avoid strong attachments. Um, this also has a little bit of spin from the cynics. But with the Epicureans, you live a comfortable life surrounded by your friends. Almost kind of like Lake Wobegon or something, you know where we live in this very comfortable community. We know all of our neighbors. We go to the town hall meetings or whatever. Um, so um, so anyway, that that's what I wanted to talk to you just briefly about with the Greeks. I'm also going to have a video uh, that I want you to watch about Alexander the Great on YouTube. It won't be that long. And that will suffice for this unit on the Greeks. Uh, so the next time I pick up, the next lecture we'll get, uh, we'll we'll start on the Romans, um, and you will have an exam following uh, this 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 unit. Uh, we'll establish that sometime next week after Tuesday. Um, we'll we'll establish a time for that. Anyway, have a great day, and uh, I'll be with you soon again on the next lecture. Bye.